Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is a very exciting Bitcoin Answers today. I am Leah Wald, the CEO of Valkyrie. Again, welcome. Welcome to Bitcoin Answers, our investment advisor focused webinar series. Today, we are very lucky and honored to have Bernard Robertson on today. Thank you, Bernard. Bernard is the principal senior investment consultant at Hackett Robertson Tovey Group in New Orleans. And I will say, because it's too exciting. He also <laughs> played pro football with the Bears and the Bills and also the Raiders. So we have quite a holistic gentleman on the call today uh, and also my partner, Stephen McClurk, who is our CIO. But Bernard, welcome. Thank you much for so much for being here. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you. Awesome. And Stephen, good morning. Morning. <laughs> All right. So the agenda for today um, I'm going to be the most benevolent dictator that I can be right now. Um, you know, I'm going to ask uh, Bernard a couple questions, uh, get to know Bernard a little bit better, and then I'm going to pass uh, the mic off to Bernard to ask all his hopefully most difficult questions to Stephen for today. Uh, and then I'll jump back in. I don't know if we're going to have questions, uh, the ability to ask uh, questions from the audience today, but I will be looking uh, and then I'll close this out at the end, but this should be a really fun hour. Um, so again, Bernard, thanks for being here. Um, so firstly, can you just tell us, you know, about your background? It's brilliant and very fascinating. So I'm just going to pause there. Please tell us about yourself and, and your group. Okay. Um, I'm hesitant to always talk about myself, but love talking about my partners and uh, my staff here at Hackett Robertson Toad Group. Um, Quick on me, just to add on to what you said, yes, I am a uh, retired, sometimes called former NFL player, um, had the ability to be drafted into the NFL out of college and played uh, with the Bears, Bills, and Raiders, as you stated. Um, and towards the end of my career, injury was something that I had to rehab from and had to think seriously about what I wanted to do next. And one of my passions uh, was investing. I had been investing since I was in the fourth grade. My grandfather got me started uh, back way back when, when you had to pull out the newspaper and read the money section and look for your tickers. Uh, we started getting into Coca-Cola stock, something simple, identifiable, easy, and um, that replaced the toys and everything else that he would buy for us. I got money to buy stock. And the better I did with the uh, stock picks and when I purchased, I got more money. Um, it, you know, kids like getting more money, so that turned into a hobby, that hobby became a passion the older I got. And I was able to uh, leave the NFL and go straight into working at a Wall Street firm um, and building up a client base in the retail space. Um, while doing that over the course of the last 16, 17 years now, um, I was able to venture into other aspects, institutional consulting, private equity. Um, and now we're looking at uh, decentralized currencies and cryptocurrencies. Um, that is something that brought my partner and I together where we had a stint together at Merrill Lynch uh, and we began discussing how we saw our futures and our practices coming together. And a few years ago, we decided to just go ahead and take the leap and merge our practices and create uh, the Hackett Robertson Toad Group. And out of that, we've built up a, a good practice, a good holistic firm. We're one of the few African-American owned firms um, in the country. Uh, we would like to change that, but uh, we are also woman owned, which is important. And then uh, we have history with that being the first woman and minority owned uh, investment consulting firm that worked strictly with pensions dating all the way back to 1988. So it, it's a storied history uh, of the firm and we want to continue growing and making sure that we create a space where women and minorities can not only uh, have us as their advisors and become clients, but also uh, hang their shingles where they can come and develop their own practices as well. 
I love that. Thank you so much, Bernard. Stephen, I'm going to toss it to you for a second as well. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, first of all, thanks, thanks, Bernard, for uh, joining us. Um, my my background isn't quite as interesting. I um, <laughs> spent a lot of my time in traditional finance. Um, I did, however, take a little stint and worked in video games for a couple of years. So uh, we, we we might talk about that later uh, as we're as we're as we're getting into uh, the metaverse and uh, digital currencies. But uh, most of my career <clears throat> was a was a portfolio manager at Guggenheim. Um, I managed uh, assets uh, mostly in fixed income, but also in private equity, uh, and uh, and uh, worked a lot with uh, insurance companies, pension funds, and uh, sovereign wealth funds. So, uh, and then got to the uh, really got to blockchain in 2016, and then um, uh, and then specifically in uh, crypto asset management, starting in about 2017. Uh, so uh, I've, I've been I've been in, in the blockchain space now for about five years. Good. Incredible. Um, awesome. Awesome. And I will just say, because it's important in the chat, someone already just said that that was so inspiring, Bernard. I also agree. So, you know, it's, it's great to have you on and, and such a different perspective. Um, so I'm going to dive in with you first. You're going to be in the hot seat and then you get to throw Steven in the hot seat. He's good at okay. being there. Um, but first, just, you know, so that we understand how you look at investments, um, because I think you and Stephen may see things similarly and also differently. Um, so let's just, you know, take a step back and I'd love to learn from you. You know, can you tell us just a little bit about your practice and what, what makes you guys different or what's your overarching investment philosophy? Yeah. Um, so overarching, uh, our philosophy is long-term relationship, long-term hope. Uh, we are looking at doing a lot of uh, due diligence and research on the front end and coming up with a strategy that allows for us to outlast any dips or any uh, market noise that may present itself. So we are a buy and hold strategy primarily. Um, and we look at what risk on assets are going to benefit clients the best. We, the benefit from having both retail and institutional and that access to uh, large clients where we're managing several hundred millions if not a couple billion of dollars for them allows us to trickle that down to uh, our clients that we're ma managing you know a couple hundred thousand for um, that is primarily our focus we want to take folks and, and turn them into millionaires that's what we're here for and we want them to be happy and comfortable in meeting their goals. Uh, as far as a firm philosophy, we, we are fairly conservative in that regard. Um, and we're opening up um, into uh, new spaces. Uh, like I said, you know, the cryptos, Bitcoin specifically, uh, is something that's newer to our firm, but as we get younger in the firm as well. We add new new folks in. We have you know a little bit of a battle of the generations where the, the philosophy and the, the thought process behind what is added to portfolios is a little different. But we recognize that um, our kids are going to be our clients uh, and their friends very soon, and we need to be prepared in that regard to help them. So we're we're preparing for that so you're, you're preparing to travel down the wild west i love it yeah <laughs> i get it so i guess the question is you know how were you first introduced to digital assets and um especially as you say you're more of a conservative minded firm you know why would you think that this asset class even deserves a place in your client portfolios most folks say it's just way too volatile right um well, I entered into this mark, well, into this profession uh, just as Google was coming aboard, right? And I had, uh, you know, the gray hairs at that time, which I've started catching up with a couple of them, um, were saying, I, I just don't see why you would spend 80 bucks on the IPO for a search engine. I, it just doesn't make sense. And I did, you know, and I was aggressive in that, that 
space and getting clients to adopt some of that because I grew up with the computer. I grew up making sure that if we wanted to search for anything, you know, we had Yahoo, we had Bing, well, we didn't have Bing at the time, we had Google, um, we had Jeeves, we had a couple, now I'm really dating myself, That's we cheap. had a couple of those, right, and we were able to just plug in a question and uh, at least narrow down a search, whereas the previous generation went to the encyclopedia, and, you know, it was harder for them to adopt. Fast forward 20 years, and we're looking at the next iteration of what's new, what's a little volatile for now. And I am, you know, driving my kids to practice and their friends are in the back and they're all having a conversation regarding, uh, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, Dogecoin, uh, and, and a couple other uh, cryptos. And we're sitting, I'm trying to figure out exactly what's going on with that and I've heard these things in the news, but we have not paid attention to them. So uh, I had to start paying attention. And I, I credit my kids with that because they, if they're interested, and I couldn't get them interested in a stock portfolio, this is something that we need to pay attention to for uh, our future clients. That's fantastic. So one last question for you, and then I may hold a couple just in case there's time at the end. Um, I'm really interested in your thoughts on this. You know, Bitcoin is already down roughly 50% from its all-time highs in November. Right. Um, from your perspective, and it doesn't need to be specific to Bitcoin on this, you know, but how do you manage client expectations who are fearful during times of volatility? It's really a general question, but obviously prescient to also this webinar. Yeah, um, I, I guess the simplest answer would be now's a good time to buy. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, there, there's a sale on. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that the asset is uh, without merit that you should stay away from it, but you should do what we encourage all clients to do is to know your risk profile, to know how much you're willing to assume in order to get a return. And then I go back to our overarching philosophy is long-term relationships. So we're not going to buy for the simple fact of seeing it rise to an all-time high a couple months later and then liquidate. We're holding for the long-term so that when we're setting goals, the, the term meets the goals. Um, and we'll see, you know, it's, it's, like we said, it's half of what it was in November. Those that buy in now will have the opportunity to see some appreciation happen over the next year that is going to really uh, affect a lot of people's lives. And um, it, 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 again, it's a great opportunity. So measuring how much risk, measuring what your goals are, making sure they match, uh, that's pretty much what we're going to, to get them to. If it's too much risk for you, obviously we say stay away. I think that makes total sense. Thank you so much. And Bernard, I, I pass it to you. Ask Stephen whatever you'd like. I really look forward to being able to just sit back and listen to you guys and learn from you today. So thank you again. Sure, sure. Thank you. Um, so knowing I was coming to sit with you, Stephen, I had a number of friends and colleagues that shot me some questions. I had some questions. If my kids could be watching right now, I'm pretty sure they would have even more questions because they ask me and I just don't have the answers for them. Uh, but some of the questions are straightforward. Some of them are a little uh, deeper. And one of the things that I wanted to get out the way first is what everybody else is paying attention to. We're in an inflationary environment right now. Um, we're seeing the Fed say that interest rates are going to uh, you know, increase. They're going to cut quantitative easing. They're going, they, there's a schedule. We think it's built into the market already, but what is your perception of what's truly gonna happen and how that's gonna affect the market and how that's gonna affect uh, Bitcoin? Yeah, absolutely. Thank, thanks, Bernard. Um, well, I do see that uh, some of what the Fed has spoken 
is written into the market, some has not. Right. Uh, so for instance, um, they, they, they announced tapering you know, almost a year ago, and then they increased tapering. Uh, they doubled down on it so that uh, uh, they would finish their increase in bond buying in the bond buying program uh, by the end of March. Uh, so, so now the balance sheet will stay flat. They'll continue to reinvest uh, cash flow that comes off of the bonds as they mature and pay interest, but they're not going to increase the balance sheet anymore. And that really, that part of the program really hasn't, wasn't priced into the market until a few weeks ago. Uh, and then uh, this last week, um, the Fed, I think the market realized that, well, the Fed is real. They're, they are going to increase rates uh, probably sometime by May. Uh, so, so I believe the first rate hike is going to happen in May. I don't think it's fully priced in yet. Um, a lot of people are calling from anywhere between four to seven rate hikes this year. Uh, we don't even have one rate hike fully priced in uh, because uh, what's going to happen when that first rate hike hits is, uh, you know, interest rates are going to go up, mortgage rates are going to go up, uh, and short-term lending is going to go up. When I talk about short-term lending, um, I think about the high yield markets, uh, which are priced to the five year. And right now there are a lot of companies that can barely afford their debt service. Um, they're not selling goods at a fast enough rate to produce the revenue to service their debt. And when they refinance their debt and all companies that issue uh, junk bonds, every one of them um, have to refinance. They can't just simply pay it off. They're not like Apple. Uh, that you know that has a as a, a a giant treasury they could just pay off their you know pay off their debt if they wanted to uh, they have to refinance and if they refinance at this higher rate after that first rate hike then you're probably going to see a few companies that should have gone out of business in the last five years that actually happened to uh, we we saw that happen to Toys R Us and Sears in in recent times not too recent but in recent times yeah, that was painful. And, Oh, it was very painful when 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 interest rates began to go up. They couldn't afford their debt service anymore, and we'll probably see that happen to companies like uh, Nordstrom, for instance. Nordstrom can't even get a line of credit uh, for um, uh, to hold inventory, right? So that's going to be devastating to the market. Uh, we probably have another eight percent drop in the Nasdaq to come before that first rate hike is totally priced in. The second thing that I think is going to happen is when that when that first rate hike comes, and I think that will be priced in by that first rate hike, the rest of the market's going to wake up and say, oh my God, we've got three to four more coming. And then we're going to very quickly, the market's going to very quickly price in the next four rate hikes. And then there's, and then something's going to have to happen, right? I mean, we're in a midterm election cycle. And um, it's it's very difficult for the uh, um, you know for the for the for the ruling party to uh, uh, get reelected when markets are down. Uh, but so we're, you're going to have to see this administration be more aggressive in whatever it is that they do to kind yeah. of remedy this. Yeah, and and right now they're being very aggressive on on inflation, in which they should. Right, that's the right path. You know, uh, in inflation is out of control. Uh, Seven percent CPI when uh, bonds are yielding less than two percent. That means your clients are losing five percent by holding treasuries. That's not that's not great. You know, on a on a real basis. Uh, and gasoline prices are going up. Food prices are going up. Um, everyone's finally admitted that it's not transitory. That this is this is real inflation. That's that is a reflection of very loose monetary policy for the last 12 years. Uh, and it's finally culminated now with uh, a, a rise in wage growth. So, um, so no, I don't, think, I don't think we're fully priced in. And, uh, but, but, I, but I do think that we're on this path for at least a little while. But as you know, things can change course very quickly. I mean, we both, we both lived through the the financial crisis of you know, 2007 <laughs> to 2009. Right. And you remember in February, 2009, things turned on a dime. Uh, all it takes is a major policy decision and, um, and, and things change. So, so look, we, we, we are bearish on the general market, but 
we're, and, and we have been for six months and we've been prepping ourselves, but you also have to prepare yourselves for when things change. And, and, and I think that's coming in the next six months as well. Okay, that's good. With that being said, those that are firmly in the middle class, those that are retired and depend on some of their securities for income, where do you see them being able to go during this period of time to be able to get total return, to be able to get that income to fuel their life that they need to supplement any earned income if, or pension income that they may have? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a really good question because, you know, we've, we've had a conventional wisdom for the last 30 years that you should hold a 60-40 or 70-30 portfolio right. Um, when you're in an era, which we're in, this isn't, inflation's not going away tomorrow. It's no. not going away next year. It's hard to bring it back down once it gets up. <laughs> 12, 12 years of loose monetary policy can, you know, it doesn't lead to just a few months of, of bad inflation numbers. Um, so, so, so we need to be prepared for a high inflationary environment for, for at least a good period of time here. And if so, so a lot of our models, I think, need to be blown up a little bit. You know, we need to think with our inflation hats on and those and, 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 and assets that do well in inflation are risk assets, right? Uh, whether they're equities, uh, cryptocurrencies is a new asset that will do well in a risk on environment, which is an inflationary environment. Uh, I actually believe that they'll, they'll do extraordinarily well compared to other risk assets in an inflationary environment. Um, sure, they've been shaken up in the last few weeks and, and, and last couple of months, uh, but I think uh, now's, a, you know, we're, we're starting to get good entry points um, for, for, for long-term behavior. Uh, you know, and, you know, art is something that the very wealthy have always uh, gotten into, but, um, you know, I think there's, there's more and more opportunities for middle class to buy, uh, art, or at least fractionalized art, or digital art, or or even collectibles. You know, even you, even classic cars is a good investment. Speak uh, on that but, a little bit more, because one of the things that, um, if you're coming from the traditional sense and you're in the brokerage, fractional shares used to be taboo. Um, everything that you just listed, art, automotives. Um, you know, any of those things. And now you have NFTs and other, they're all classified as alternatives and they were a step above speculative, you know, penny stocks. How have they now become uh, more mainstream as part of that changing in that 60-40 split? Yeah, I, I think it really is due to inflation, you know? And um, maybe I'll cover a couple of different things in that inflationary environment, but but let's talk about Bitcoin first, right? Because that's sort of the, the genesis of it all. Um, you know, Bitcoin will only ever have less than 21 million Bitcoin. So there's a limited supply. It's a currency, but it's a lot of other things too. Uh, it's also a network that you have an ownership piece of when you, when, you, when you own it. And as more and more people utilize that network, its value grows similarly to the way the US dollar's value had grew as that network grew globally and was a currency pair for almost every major currency in the world. Right. Uh, Bitcoin is becoming a, not only just a major currency pair, but a, a currency that you can spend on things. Uh, in some countries, I mean, I know El, everybody uses the, the El Salvador, Salvador example. Yeah. You can buy anything in El Salvador with Bitcoin. Um, you can go almost anywhere in certain cities and use Bitcoin to buy things. Uh, you can use it for large transactions. There's a painting behind me that I bought with Bitcoin, right? Um, I've been seeking out local artists that I think are, you know, going to do well, and I buy using Bitcoin. So, 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 so that's Bitcoin. That's you know, that's sort of the genesis of of, of digital currencies. And then we get into things like uh, NFTs. Now, NFTs is very speculative right now. It's the Wild West. Um, you know, there's a handful of people that really know what they're doing here. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't recommend it for, you know, orphans and widows, you know, uh, as the common saying goes, or even people that, that, that want to speculate, you know, um, 
it's it's very very speculative but it is a way to access digital art right but then the fractionalized thing that we talked about earlier too i mean uh there's we were always looking at ways of fractionalizing hard assets um similar to way etfs fractionalize a basket of 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 equities and there's more and more ability to do that with blockchain technology so um so so the ability to fractionalize art there was actually i, I don't know if you remember that story about you know the auction of the uh of, of the cons you know of, of one of the copies of the constitution and uh it ended up being purchased by by paul tudor jones i believe but there was a group of people that had fractionalized shares in a in a in a DAO or you know digital mm -hmm. corporation that, that were trying to buy it so so that's a good example of 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 having partial ownership of something that could appreciate in value yeah that that's not only intriguing but it's a little scary as well for those that are new to that space you've been in it for several years uh how do we you know measure success when it comes to that how do we think i'm going to put a fractional share here i'm going to invest a fractional share there how do we measure what that looks like on in the long run to help those that may be speculating mm -hmm. but more so those that are looking at how they can operate in an inflationary world now um, with a non-traditional 60 40 uh, split portfolio. Yeah. So look, I'm going to, I'm just going to say at the moment, that's very difficult, mm -hmm. right? We're, we're still in very early stages. Uh, I don't think there's enough data yet to, you know, as a, as a, as a fiduciary, put it in your client's portfolio, um, you know, for, 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 for most clients anyway. Um, and, uh, but, but it's something that we've got to watch, right? And, and, I, and, I, and I think that, you know, the technology is there, things are being built. I think in two years from now, we're, we're going to have a, a, you know, a better ability to do that. You know, there's, there's a couple of random ETFs out there that, you know, I hate these ETFs that are, that are, you know, like trying to be the NFT ETF that doesn't really invest in NFTs and invest in like maybe a hundred companies. And they include things like, you know, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, just because, Standard they made some small investment, right. some early stage NFT. I'm just like, that's you know, those are those are weak investments in my opinion. Okay. Um, but uh, but 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 I but I but I, but I think this like you know, I, I think you'll start seeing more and more come out. You know, more and more more private sales of you know of of NFTs and other other digital art and. And, and, and physical art as well. Uh, it's, it's, it's in the near future. It's not here. It's not here quite yet. That is, I mean, it's, it's exciting, like I said, you know, and I'm thinking back to things that my kids were saying, where, you know, I tried to invest $1,000 for them into GE. First, they ask, what is GE? <laughs> and why and why would I want to invest in GE? And I had to think about how there's that disconnect between our generations, uh, both my parents and mine, and their generation and the one coming behind them, and how they see risk on as far as in investments. They're they've been doing. Um, crypto investing, if you will, uh, for a while. They, they've grown up with digital currencies in video games. They've grown up with digital currency as part of a way of taking the US dollar and transferring it into a digital dollar. There's Roblox books, and then there's Minecraft, and then there's, uh, you know, probably the king of them all with uh, Fortnite. How is that soft introduction to um, decentralized currency going to be different? You're saying in the next five years, I'm thinking maybe sooner. Um, how is that going to be that much of a impact 
on the world that we know. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, I think I think the digital currency concept is 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 here and it's it's now, right? right. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, we talked about this earlier. Uh, our our kids, you know, used to play Fortnite. You know, my kids and your kids, and we've spent a lot of money. You know, a giving lot a lot of money, money. buying <laughs> eBooks. Right. Right. And, and, and it's like, okay, you're, you're, you're spending money for these things called V-Bucks so that you can, you know, dress up your character in a video game. Yeah, I, I had to learn what a skin was. When I first heard that, I, I thought, okay, you're bu buying hides in the game. That's kind of morbid. They were like, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm buying skins where you, you can personify yourself or uh, uh, make up your avatar as right. to who you want it to be. It took a, a little bit of learning. There is a learning curve there. So yeah, but 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 it is a but it is a culture, and it is you know the the, the prominent culture now among among that age group, right? If right. you think about it like this, right? Um, you know where you know where where you and I both live. Uh, a lot of people are members of a country club. Yeah, and we 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 you know, and a lot of people that are members of country clubs like to uh, buy the, the polos or the, or, the, or the throw over at their country club that has the logo on it. So that when they go out and have dinner and go to school events and go to other events, everybody knows that, oh, you must be a member at this country club because I see your logo. It's, it's, it's a flex. It is. Right? Otherwise you would just buy generic polo or something okay. like that. But like, no, no, I'm a, I'm a member of this exclusive club. Well, uh, our, our kids' generation, and even and even the online generation, which which we're also a part of, whether it's Twitter, or Instagram, and you see people buying things like apes to put on their profile picture and other things, all that is is saying, "Hey, I'm part of that country club. I don't I don't play golf, but I'm part of the board apes yacht club. I can afford wow. that. I'm letting everybody know that I'm part of this group, and I can afford to be in that group." I hadn't thought about it in that regard, but it makes sense. Yeah. Exclusivity sells. We want to be able to be part of those small circles and whatever else that may derive from them. At mm -hmm. the country club, usually we, you know, do a lot of networking and I'm pretty sure they're doing a lot of digital networking with these NFTs as well. That's right. Well, and even my kids made fun of me because, you know, I, I, I sat down and started playing Fortnite with them, you know, a few years ago too. They're like, dad, you got to update your skin. I'm like, because I was just doing you know, the basic free one. I'm right. like, why would I do that? Like, everybody's going to make fun of you. Like, if you don't have the skin that just came out in the latest, the last month's right. package, then you're basically homeless, dad. <laughs> to yeah, over, I, I, like a homeless person. You can't I afford it. I realized clothes. a couple years ago while trying to do the same with my kids, we're playing Madden. And the last time I really played Madden and got into it, I, I think I was in the game. Um, the kids would spend three, four hours before we actually had a, a session where we, we got on the sticks, as I'm told they're called now, mm -hmm. um, and played. They would build a profile, build a play sheet. They would customize individual players. They would take their entire team through seasons so that they could build up character. I would get on and just, you know, select all Madden and let Madden pick the playbook and run different plays. But I could never, I would get blown out because they had this much dedication. And I got that exact same uh, kind of spiel. You, it was, I was busted. Right. That was the terminology. Yeah. I was busted because I used what was given instead of customization. And it's a different world. I think that leads to a lot of new opportunities, whether it be volatile or not. I think it still is where the new horizon is with the old guard going out. You mentioned Nordstrom having, you know, a hard time getting uh, uh, access to capital for his debt service. That's the old guard having a hard time being able to keep up with the young bucks. Nike is now making, you know, uh, wearables in the metaverse. 
I still can't fathom. I like to have my Jordans on my feet, but I can understand someone being more interested in buying them uh, via the metaverse. So the changing of the guard is here. Uh, and I just think that in those next two or three years, it's going to have a profound impact. I, I agree. And, and, and just like when you have to spend dollars to get your V-Bucks so that you have a currency in the ecosystem that you're spending right. a lot of your time in, Bitcoin is that currency of the digital economy. Yeah. Right. That's why forward thinkers like, you know, I'll, I'll say Elon Musk, even though he keeps talking about Dogecoin, which is ridiculous. Um, and, and Michael Saylor um, are, I mean, they're, they're running tech companies and they're early adopters. And there's a lot of other companies that are adding Bitcoin to their balance sheet, right? And they, they are the early adopters. They're, these, are, these are heads of companies where those companies are going to do things, right? If they're, if, if they're thinking that far in advance and understanding that Bitcoin is the is the currency of the digital economy, mm -hmm. right? That the dollar is the currency of the US economy, but the digital economy is global and it's different than the physical economy here or yes. within either other country's borders. And if you wanna transact in that digital economy, you, you, you've gotta have Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's, the, that's the standard now. That's the, that's the common currency for me to buy something from somebody in the Philippines or vice versa uh, very quickly and efficiently uh, and in large amounts. Uh, or that's become the currency of if I want to travel to certain countries, um, do I want to trade dollars for their currency and then pay some high fee to do the trade or just hold Bitcoin and then use Bitcoin universe. as I travel, right? So would you say that is where the value lies for uh, crypto? We've got comments, we have questions, I'm, I'm sorry, in the comment section where folks are asking, how do I explain the value to my clients? Well, we know future generations, those coming behind us, see the value or see the usage of uh, cryptos and specifically Bitcoin. How do you explain that to older clients? Yeah, well, if you think back to um, Bretton Woods, right? And what, what happened there was that the U.S. established the U.S. dollar as the dominant trading pair, as the dominant currency of, of the global economy. Mm -hmm. And once that happened, it forced everybody to have exposure to dollars. And when everybody has to have exposure to dollars, the, the, the strength of the currency grows, which is what allowed the U.S. to be able to print more and more and more money without debasing it too much. The network grew while dollars were being printed. And that's what offset that. And those dollars printed funded, you know, a military and global operations uh, to maintain the strength of that currency. Uh, think about Bitcoin as the more and more people that enter that network and become part of that network, it grows that economy. And that's what grows the value of Bitcoin. Uh, think you can also think about it uh, like the stock market, right? The more and more people that own a stock, the less float there is, the less float there is, the higher the price goes up. Bitcoin's the same type of thing. The more and more people that own it and are storing it and are utilizing it creates more value of the individual token. And given that you can't just print more, that, that there is a supply cap means that it's almost anti-deflationary uh, in that sense, or inflationary. So with that said, what makes Bitcoin the king? We, we know that it came to the forefront very early in, in the crypto space. It's the most widely known, but why is it king versus Elon's favorite with Dogecoin, right? What, what's the differentiator there? Yeah. Um, Doge used a lot or most of the code of Bitcoin. So, so really what makes Bitcoin king, it wasn't the first digital currency, by the way. There were others before it, but it was the first one that was really accepted. 
by cryptologists, by the math, math, uh, math, math medical community, mm-hmm. by developers, and uh, the first that got a lot of attention and, and, and widespread growth, right, that, that, that was used to transact in things. And um, so it's gained a lot of market share as a currency. Um, it's also very secure and it's limited supply. Are, are all the all the factors? And there's many more factors that that really make it the king at the moment. The difference between Bitcoin and say Dogecoin is Dogecoin has unlimited supply. It was built as a joke to do all the things opposite of Bitcoin. It just produces more and more Dogecoin every day, right? And uh, so it's sort of like a it's sort of like a joke, and that you know it 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 is what it is. It was fun for a while. Um, but uh, but then there's other digital assets as well, right? I mean, somebody just just asked about ETH, right? Well, ETH is something a little bit different. ETH, ETH is the currency of a protocol, right? So if everybody, almost everybody has an iPhone or an Android phone or something like that, and when you're utilizing data on that, you know, if you're in the US, you pay in dollars. If you're in other countries, you pay in that currency. Um, and uh, and in most other countries, we, we don't we don't see this in the, in the in the U.S. a lot. But you pay per the amount of data that you use. Right. Um, ETH is the currency of its own protocol. So when people are utilizing that specific protocol, they're paying what's called gas fees or or, or network fees for that protocol. Um, because it's tied specifically to that protocol, it does make it a little bit more difficult to make it just kind of like broad based currency, right? Transaction fees are very high. It's very specific. Um, you know, at the moment, I, I don't know where ETH transaction fees. Last I looked, it was like under 20 bucks to make a transaction. So imagine buying a cup of coffee, <laughs> you know, you a dollar for a cup of coffee and it costs right. you $120 in transaction fees, you know, but as a, as a currency for its own protocol, where a lot of these NFTs that we're talking about, right? So NFTs that you're spending you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on, you're okay paying high gas fees because that protocol that stores those NFTs are very secure, right? It might be cheaper on another platform like say Solano, but Solano uh, lacks the security that ETH has, right? Uh, It's had security issues just in the last six months, right? So would 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 you trust a new protocol like Solano, uh, that 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 has proven security issues to transact NFTs on, that you're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on. No, probably not. But you would buy that cup of coffee with Solano. <laughs> That's exactly right. Exactly. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. So that proves their usefulness and the reason why there's hundreds, if not thousands, now of different currencies that digital currencies that we can explore. But back to Bitcoin, with Bitcoin in it, we're, we're looking at its usefulness, one, but also its capability to have capital appreciation where it grows. As we said, it was down earlier, uh, you know, more than at right, roughly about half of its all time high. It has the ability to grow back in value and have that capital appreciation where it's an investment more than just a useful tool. Absolutely. And, okay. and, and, I, and, I, and I believe where, where Bitcoin is right now, um, you know, and I, I've been saying this since October, I was like, you know, it's, Bitcoin is probably gonna follow the rest of the market down. We're, we're now at a point where we're closer to where I believe the, the lows of the year are uh, than we are to the highs of the year. So we might go down a little bit further from here. You know, the, I, I think the whole market's going to go down further. But if you're a long-term investor, you know, these are, these are good entry points, right? Um, you know, I mean, I think, I think uh, worst case scenario for Bitcoin going into, you know, everything I talked about with, with the Fed is, you know, we, we might go as low as 25,000. We might not. Uh, we, we, we might go as low as 32. Um, it just it just all depends on what policy decisions are made uh, on, on you know around the general economy, but but these are these are these are good entry points if you're holding for more than a year. Um, I, I I think they're great entry points actually. Uh, so you know if you're if you're looking for a quick buck 
quick trade, I uh, probably wouldn't enter here. But if you're if you're if you're an investor, um, we're we're cheap. So with that being said, is it a good time to look at products or vehicles that will allow clients to gain excess versus coming out of pocket thirty thousand for one coin? Or should they be looking at dollar cost averaging in and buying at different price points just over time? Where, where do you see the best value or a couple of the best values in accessing Bitcoin? Yeah, so, so things that are readily available to say financial advisors, um, you know, I, I would be looking at not necessarily Bitcoin directly at the moment. I mean, that, that, that's okay, you can. Right. I mean, it's a good way to, you know, buying Bitcoin directly or, or through a fund or a trust or something like that might might not be a bad idea right now. But the things that I prefer to purchase right now are, say, ETFs that hold baskets of companies that are that are tied to Bitcoin in some way. Right. One example might be companies that hold Bitcoin on their balance sheet. Like I said earlier, these companies are a little bit more innovative. Mm -hmm. If Bitcoin continues to drop a little bit, then you've got some downside protection by the the company that's holding Bitcoin on their balance sheet, right? Uh, that 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 have other lines of business, you know, other economies. Um, and then, um, you know, I think I think Bitcoin miners are are, are a really good play right now too, right? So 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 companies that mine Bitcoin, um, you know, they're they're producing Bitcoin for themselves at levels cheaper than the cost of Bitcoin today, right? So if, 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 if you're running a mining company and you're, you're producing Bitcoin at a cost of say $20,000 per Bitcoin, that's a really good value right now. You know, if Bitcoin is. goes down to 25, then you've, you, you know, that, that company is still do, doing, doing, doing better than buying Bitcoin directly. And and then you have the upside of you know the potential upside of, of Bitcoin when it when it when it spikes back up, uh, you know we're we're very positive on, on on those two sectors at the moment. Okay, all right. Um, we had some more questions. Let me see if we can get to that. Um, Bitcoin is not acting like a store of value or an inflation hedge. How do you see? it as being a store can it be a store or would you recommend it for an inflation hedge given what we're seeing in the markets today you know i i don't really see it as a as a store of value the way that a lot of other people that in, you know that are you know the bigger names that invest in bitcoin do i that's that's never been a narrative that that has appealed to me much um i do see it long term as an inflation hedge, it's not acting like one today. Sometimes it will act like an inflation hedge. You know, when the when 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 we're printing money and we're adding to the balance sheet, Bitcoin scary does though. Really yes, out. yeah. But when there's but when there's quantitative tightening, which is happening right now, right? Then you know, anytime that there's a change in direction from the Fed, whether it's hey, we're about to do quantitative easing, or hey, we're about to do quantitative tightening, pretty much everything moves together, mm -hmm. right? A rising tide floats all boats. It also causes them to sink, you know, when the, when the tide goes out, right? And right now the tide is going out. So just, you know, it's, it's sell everything, right? That's the attitude of markets right now. But then once the sell everything uh, attitude is, is, is kind of played out, then people start looking for buried treasure, looking for things that are, that, that, that actually have value. And I think that's when that's when, when, when Bitcoin will start acting like that inflation hedge again. Um, but if you think about the, you know, the, where the price of Bitcoin has gone, uh, you, you zoom out a little bit, you know, I mean, yeah, you're, you're, you're looking at the last three months, but, um, but as you start to zoom out, you know, Bitcoin has been a great inflation hedge and, and, and well outperformed it. So, uh, you know, now just risk assets are coming back to earth a little bit. The other thing that I want to explain too is, you know, Bitcoin's not at the at the point in its life cycle to where it will act as a true inflation hedge yet. 
we're, you know, we're, we're just now getting out of that speculative stage. You know, the first few years was very speculative for Bitcoin. Is this going right. to happen? Is this going to be a thing or not? You know, highly speculative. And then it kind of moved into that risk asset stage where it's a little bit more correlated to the equity markets and certain equity markets and, and behaves like a risk asset. Um, I, I think we're getting closer to where, you know, sometimes it behaves as an inflation head, sometimes not, doesn't act purely. But uh, I think as it, as it, as the as it starts to grow in in size of network, uh, I, I believe it will in the future. But it's not a pure inflation hedge right now. So we're still in the early adoption phase with it, and once we get more comfortable with it, find more applications. You know, hopefully El Salvador <laughs> is not a one off, and we'll see more of a, a a rise as an accepted and common, basically, it an equity. Exactly. That's yeah. exactly right. Um, I got one interesting question that was here, uh, or statement, I should say, and then question. It, uh, Nintendo asked, is China, is Bitcoin a Chinese Trojan horse? They state that it's scary that we don't know who technically created Bitcoin. Um, it, it, there's a name throwing around Satoshi, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly. Sat yeah, Satoshi. Uh, but most miners were operating in China prior to last year, and then they were kicked out and God knows where they are now. How do you all who work in this space daily see that? Yeah, so just like a lot of uh, open source software, uh, there are gonna be people that identify themselves and there are going to be people that are synonymous, I mean, sorry, anonymous or use pseudonyms uh, when, they, when they support open source software with their code. So Satoshi, uh, who Satoshi. Is a, a pseudonym for the, for, the, for the person who came up with the, uh, with the concept and wrote what's, what we refer to as the Satoshi white paper, um, uh, with this whole idea of, of what Bitcoin was going to be. That was really just the kicking off point, uh, but but the Bitcoin network was built by many many different developers, some who we know the names of, some you know some who who we don't. And as time has gone on, there are a lot of people that are that are that are Bitcoin core developers that continue to uh, freely work on the code and uh, and continue to improve the network. So uh, it's it's not just one person. First of all. Um, and, and it's almost good that it's not a, a, a named person at the center of the whole thing. Right. right. Um, you so know, it's, it's not tied to them and whatever happens with them. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's exactly right. I, I think <clears> it's <throat> a good thing. Um, and, uh, but, but, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, it is a collection of a lot of different people that have, that have added over the years, uh, to, to this network and people do it without, without pay. They do it, they do it out of passion. Right. right? Uh, which is which is fantastic. Uh, there, there's actually foundation set up for for Bitcoin core devs where uh, where where, you know, you can you can donate to their efforts because they're they're doing it for the love of the network and they're doing it because, you know, for, for them, it's art. It's what they it's what it's what they it's what they love. So uh, uh, second of all, uh, with China, I actually was concerned with so many mine miners that were being set up in China. Uh, it seemed to be a little bit concentrated at the time. And it's actually a good thing that uh, the Chinese government shut that down uh, because it's allowed the network to spread out all over the world. I mean, this, right. is, a, this is a global economy, right. <laughs> you, know, uh, uh, you know, software, uh, it should be spread out. Uh, and, and we're getting the benefit of a lot of that in the US, which is really growing, um, you know, the, you know, the fintech environment uh, in the U.S. and the blockchain environment in the U.S. Uh, so uh, one of the states that is that is uh, benefiting highly from uh, miners moving is Texas. Uh, you know, not too far from you. Uh, anyway, anywhere there's uh, there's shale. Uh, a lot of these people are moving to places where they can take um, you know natural gas. Uh, you know, anybody in the in the oil and gas business knows that when you drill for oil. The byproduct of drilling for oil is natural gas, and there's so much of it that they just can't even use it all. 
Uh, so a lot you of burn time, it off. most of it is burned off, which that's right. You know, this can be something that's recycled or captured to to help with mining. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, so instead of having it flared off, what a lot of companies are doing that are very innovative and they're doing it in, in Texas with the support of people like Senator Cruz and Governor Abbott is to take that 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 excess natural gas and utilizing it to 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 fuel Bitcoin mines. So it's essentially okay. it's, it's, it's essentially carbon zero, right? Or mm -hmm. carbon neutral mining that's happening in Texas with excess natural gas. It's it's, it's absolutely amazing. And I wanted uh, to ask you another question following that, but I want you to lean into that a little bit as to how that works because we know ESG and environmentally sustaining investments are big and we've heard the the gripes from folks that said that you know bitcoin mining is har harmful to the environment how can that be something that we work on right there and make more a common thing with capturing that excess gas well what's 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 interesting is um with with china banning bitcoin it it, it almost essentially made Bitcoin mining ESG overnight. You know, when I, and I say that word real, very, very loosely, right? right. But like uh, what was happening in China was they were, you know, you know, the, the, the government basically just gives out energy free to certain people. <laughs> and, 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 and they were just, you know, connecting to the coal mines, you know, to the coal, or, sorry, to the coal plants. And uh, when, when all of that got shut down uh, here, here in North America, uh, you know, electricity rates uh, are cheaper with, with more efficient energy, right? Whether it's hydroelectric or natural gas powered or, or you know, or other. And, um, and, and all of those miners that moved from China to North America essentially overnight uh, became more energy efficient and more environmentally sustainable. So uh, it, it kind of solved the problem. All right. Last question before we wrap it up and bring Leah back in. Um, there, is there an ETF that you are ETFs that you would recommend where you can access the coins uh, or have them uh, 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 have their risk spread across multiple coins? Yeah, so at the moment, unfortunately, there is not, you know, we're still waiting for a, you know, a pure Bitcoin spot ETF to be approved by the SEC. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we at Valkyrie have launched a few private products, um, uh, two of them in particular, one, one that holds only Bitcoin, right? If, if people mm -hmm. want to want access to Bitcoin at a, at a you know, at a, you know they, can, they can get it if, as long as they're accredited investors. And then the, uh, the second one that Valkyrie does is a multi-coin strategy where it's not an index. We, we, we don't hold Bitcoin. We only hold protocol coins. And we use a, 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 a type of mining called proof of stake mining with those protocol coins in order to gain yield. So we're essentially mining within the trust and paying yield off of those coins. And what we do is we choose our favorite uh, 10 protocol coins that we hold in that protocol trust at a time. So, uh, so, so, so we, we rebalance every month based on, based on active management. It's slow active management. We have longer time frames. We're not actively traded, trading with inside of it. Uh, and, and, we're, and we're not just creating some, some index either. You know, we, I'm not a big believer in indexes. Right. Um, uh, so, so, so that's, that's available through us for accredited investors, but at the moment, uh, there, there really is no ETF that does that. Well, uh, that, that is definitely good. And I hope that answers, uh, the, the question for the attendee. With that said, we're, we're done. This has been fun. Uh, Leah's back on, uh, turn it over to you, uh, to guide us on out. That was incredible, gentlemen, and perfect timing, top of the hour. So I'll close us out in less than a minute. Again, Bernard, it was an absolute pleasure having you on today. Thank you so much. Oh, and thank you. The, pl the pleasure was mine. This was fun learning more and being able to put it all together. 
Love it. Love it. Well, TBD, there's the, you know, uh, to be continued, I should say, TBC. Um, everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, you know, this is our, our bi-weekly learning hour. Um, and our next one, I believe, is February 8th. Uh, if you've requested CFP credit, please note that the CFP processing is currently delayed, but it should occur within 30 days. Um, again, don't re hesitate to reach out if you have any questions as you explore this digital asset class. Valkyrie is here to help and be a guide, and I hope that everybody has a great day. Bernard and Stephen, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.